Boom! What an introduction, dude. Like, I didn't even need to do my speech now. That was enough. Nah. Um, yeah, really good to see everyone together here. I've had such an amazing time already. Some of the speeches have been just overwhelming to listen to. Namely, Ed's was really, really full on. Show my love. All the other amazing activists out here deserve uh, much respect. So, um, I have quite a colourful past, so I'm going to get into that a bit. I mean, um, if you've seen my YouTube channel, you might know a little bit about my story, but um, it's quite interesting, and I'll try to start it from day dot, see how we can go. But there's a lot to it, so we'll try to get through it. But um, so I'll start with the story when I was a, I was a really young kid. I was about five years old, and I still remember this story, and it come back to me when I went vegan. I was out the backyard of my mum's house, and it was Christmas morning, right? And my little brother was playing close to these ants, and he nearly stepped on one, right? And I was like. What are you doing? What are you doing? Don't just step on the ants. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. <laughs> and I was like, something so insignificant in many people's eyes as an ant. I, would, I didn't want to see the ant get hurt. And now that just speaks to children's innate compassion that they're born with. And somewhere along the line, that is programmed out of us. We're taught that eating na uh, animals is natural, that it's normal. Like, I went from not wanting my brother to step on an ant to thinking it's normal to eat a piece of a cow who'd been bolt gunned in the head and suffered greatly. So, we were deceived. We've, we've been deceived by society and, you know, I had an awakening. So, let's get into my, how I fell into the, the, the colourful past I did. So, around 15, 14, 15 years old, I started experimenting with drug use. Um, I had some trouble with sleeping, I had some uh, nightmares, some sleep paralysis, and I don't know whether I, f I found solitude in the drug use, but I know that I, I had a very extreme personality and I wanted to explore my psyche and I wanted to take things to the extreme. And I found, because I was such a, a lost youth, I feel like um, I found solitude in these drugs. And it started off just experimenting, you know, as you do, having fun. I didn't think there was nothing to it. I thought it was pretty cool, really. And I, I really didn't know that I had this predisposition to addiction, which many people do. A small, uh, well, a, a percentage of people have a predisposition. So some people can have, use recreational drugs and they're fine. They can do it on the weekend, but I wasn't one of those people. I wasn't. And what ended up happening is I fell into this drug use. I started hanging around with you know, a group of, of, of kids from, from a similar demographic to me, you know, they might have had, uh, they might have lived in a poor uh, neighbourhood, their parents might be split up, they've had a bit of a rough uh, uh, bringing up, and we, we shared a brotherhood. So, we started hanging around, and you know, we, we were boxers, we, we all had our heads shaved, and we thought we were pretty cool and tough and all that stuff. But, um, what ended up happening is, as you progress in this lifestyle, and you, you grow up, and um, things started getting more serious. It started off with just, you know, hanging out with street gangs, you know, having street fights with people, um, you know, committing acts of violence on the street for reputation, um, major uh, pub brawls where there was uh, bottles being thrown, people going to hospital. This was a normal thing. I mean, twice a weekend, during the week, this started happening, and it started progressively getting worse. And I progressively got more conditioned to the violence. Because of the environment that I was in, the environment you're in is the most determining factor to how you turn out. So a lot of these kids, they're in this environment with violence and gang life and, and stuff. That's all they got. That's all you've got. Like, you know, they, they, they're living in poverty. They're, there's drugs everywhere, and they, there's no purpose. They have no purpose. See, I fell into it. And I, I cultivated this side of myself that was just, there's two wolves. There's a great Indian proverb and it, it speaks of two wolves. A negative wolf and a positive wolf. And the wolf that wins is the wolf that you feed the most. Now I had a good compassionate heart, a heart inside. I know I was a compassionate person, but it didn't take long for me to condition this, this side out, out of me and I had to 
do what I had to do in that environment that I was in. It, I mean, it was a very tough time. And what, what ended up happening is that my drug use um, got worse. I was using it more frequently. I started dealing drugs. And then I fell into, it went from a normal you know, street gangs to a more serious organised crime groups. Um, some of the most notorious criminals um, in my part of Australia, I was hanging out with, they were my friends. And if anyone knows anything about friends, you become them. You become them. So these were my the people I looked up to the most. So there's things that you did to, to earn respect, and they're not moral. They're, but in that in that world, the code of morality is a lot different to normal society. So I felt like it was you know it was okay, like it was justified to commit these acts of violence when it's not. But that that was just my conditioning which is interesting if you think about uh, the Karnas conditioning, it's very similar um, to think that violence is normal, natural, necessary or justified. So what ended up happening is, because I, I, as, I was dealing these drugs, I started using them more often and I got into a toxic relationship which was very detrimental to me and I wear my heart on my sleeve and I was using these drugs in a toxic relationship, hanging around a new group of friends that didn't have my interest at heart and I had a really, really hard time. And this is where my depression was rampant, my anxiety. I didn't know who to trust. I had paranoia. I, I remember sitting on the edge of my girlfriend's. I always had a gun on me. I always had a gun on me because I was afraid of these enemies in my head. I just, like, and, and there was imminent danger in my environment. So it was a very serious thing. I had to do that for my own defense. But I remember sitting on the end of my girlfriend's bed and I stuck it in my mouth and I was just like flirting with the idea of pulling the trigger because I felt like that was the way out. I almost thought like, I, wow, this is the way out. I want to talk about another epiphany I had after a, a violent um, confrontation with another gang. Um, I went out, I had an argument with my girlfriend and I went out that night and I had a weapon in my pocket. So I already, I already come went out with this anger inside of me and I already had a preconceived idea of what was going to go down and as soon as, I, as, soon as we went to this bar there were some, some blokes there that looked like they were, wanted to fight I, I was waiting for that opportunity okay so I already had that in my mind and I, I started a, a, a fight that could have been avoided it could have been avoided and it turned out really bad it was a really bad thing and people got hurt badly and what ended up happening is, is they got in the car and they drove past us once and I moved out the way okay and I thought they'd left they'd circled back around and come back through that same uh, bar and like in the car park really fast and one of my friends was on this side of me the other was on that side and they broke up just in time and as the car hit me I jumped up in the air and I flung he hit me really hard and I went about roof height in the air and I remember, while I was in the air, was like slow motion. And I thought to myself, I brought this on myself. My actions are repeating on me. And that was the first time I sort of understood that concept of karma. And I was like, I'm dead. I'm in the air. I'm, I'm dead right now. And I caused it through my actions. Now, I didn't learn my lesson then. I needed to learn lessons the hard way. You would have thought that would have brought me out of the games. Yeah, yeah, no, Joey's clear now. No, I wasn't like that. I learned. I had made many mistakes and it took me a long time to finally learn my lesson. But what ended up happening is it all come to a head around the time my grandfather died. And I was very paranoid at this time. I, I was carrying a gun as usual. I was afraid that people were going to get me. I was paranoid. And I was running away from the police and they come to my mother's house and I couldn't attend my grandfather's funeral because they come on the day of the funeral thinking I was going to be there. But they ended up getting me at a hotel room with it down my pants. They, they found it down my pants, I was out the front of this hotel room and they pulled it out and that was it. So my first experience with prison lasted a week and it was in, uh, I was on suicide watch in solitary confinement and that is also punishment unit. So there's 10 guards that come in twice a day, search your cell, has to be perfect. It was a horrible experience. I was mourning the death of my grandfather and coming off of all these substances, very hard. I, I was released on home detention for 18 months. 
okay? Now, while I was on home detention, I hadn't learned my lesson again. It just, it wasn't enough for me. I still fell back into the gangs, even though I couldn't leave my house. On home detention, you can't leave your house. I still fell back into the gangs. I fell back into the drug use and back into the violence. It's a very seductive lifestyle, and, it, and that's all I knew. What ended up happening is I put on a lot of weight. I'm talking a lot. I put on 30 kilograms. I was 115 kilograms. Obese. Depressed. Very negative mindset. And I was looking for a way to lose weight. And I was on the internet and I found this guy. His name's Dan McDonald, the life regenerator. He's a raw vegan and he does juices. And I was watching him for weight loss advice. And he said something really significant to me. And what he said was, if you eat suffering and death, it becomes you. And already understanding the concept of karma, it really spoke to me. And it wasn't like he was telling me something new, new. Like it was like he was telling me something I already knew. Like he, it was the truth. And when you hear the truth, you understand it, you know it. Time goes by. It, that was the seed that was planted, but I didn't go vegan from that. I lost a lot of weight, got down to 90 kilograms. I've got, I went to prison, okay? When I went to prison to serve my sentence, it was, I was given 11 months and I had to serve six in there. Okay, now this was the longest period of time that I'd ever been sober for 12 years since I was 14. So that was 12 years of drug abuse, 12 years of these gangs, 12 years of fighting these demons inside of me. And I'd never stopped to look at my life and look at the mistakes I've made. I was sitting there in the cell and I could see the other prisoners and I was like, this is no life to live. That's where all the gang members go. That's where you go. You either go to jail, hospital, or you end up with a serious drug addiction. And, you know, possibly dead. I know people that have died from that lifestyle. So, I looked at things from a new perspective. Like a bird's eye view of every mistake I'd made and it led me to there. I had an epiphany. And the thing was, I was forced to be sober. I changed my environment. I was pulled out of the environment I was in. I was put into an environment where I couldn't use and I had to just be there with my own thoughts. So when I was released, I was released off parole, I had to stay sober, okay? And I had this spiritual awakening. It was like my true self come out. And I was still involved thickly in these, in these uh, gangs, these, the organized crime gangs. So as I was on the home detention the second time when I was released from jail, I, mom, I was talking to my mother about smoking. Now, I'd already been sober and I'd stopped smoking, so I was like giving her a bit, a bit of stick for it. I was like, Mum, what are you doing smoking? And she's like, you know, there's a lot of vices people have that they don't change. And what, whatever she said was very profound and significant for me because it made me reflect. And I was like, I've always said I'm going to go vegan. I've always said, like, since I got planted that seed, that it's hypocritical to say that you care for animals like save the whales, but you've got a steak on your plate. I've seen the hypocrisy on that. I've seen it, I knew it. And I've never taken action. And when my mum said that to me, I was like, I'm going vegan. The next day, I lived in alignment with my own beliefs and I went vegan. So further on from that, I was released again and I was on parole and I went and left the gangs. I went and met up with them and I said, this life isn't for me. And they understood, they'd seen the, the awakening that I had. And from that day, thank you. The problem was, not everyone sees it that way. A lot of them did see the awakening I had, but there was a serious thing happening at the time, and I really had to pull myself away. I didn't associate with any of my friends anymore. I was on my own. So once I left my, my gang, I was on my own. Any enemies I'd made in the past, I was on my own. Anything, any rivalry, I had to look after myself. And it was a very hard thing to deal with. I was just learning to re-socialise, like recondition myself to communicate sober. I was just like, what is this sobriety thing? Everything was new to me. And at the same time, I had this major anxiety because I just didn't know what was going to happen to me. It was like a big question mark. So I had to spend a lot of time by myself. It was really full on, really full on. But at the same time, the message of animal rights was galvanising in me every day. 
And I just had this story I had to share. I remember saying to a girl that I was seeing at that time, I was like, all my inspiration, like when you first go vegan, you just want to tell the world. And no one wants to listen. Mum, Dad, everyone, listen to this. And you think they're going to be like, oh wow, I'll just go vegan. But it never happens like that. So anyways, like I felt like my inspiration was falling on deaf ears. And I was like, I need a platform to share this. I need a platform to share this. And there was a few people on YouTube doing it. And I was like, I've got to do that. One day, spontaneously, I just whipped out my phone and started filming and I let a lot of things out. I felt like I needed to help people. It was like right here, burning inside my chest. And once I expressed myself and started um, speaking what I had in my heart, I didn't have that anxiety anymore. I felt like, wow, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to do. Now, the reason I mean, I help people getting sober, I help people get off drugs, and, and if, they, if they want to talk about that. But the reason I focus on the animal message so much is, is because animals are so innocent. Like, they have done literally nothing wrong to us. I remember my friend said this joke, he said, Joey, you used to be that guy who would walk up and just stab a human. And I was like, and he goes, now you won't even hurt a chicken? They're laughing at me. And I was like, yeah, but dude, the chicken never did nothing wrong to me or you. Okay? You know? I mean, this person might have done something to affect my life personally, like really bad to me. That, that, that's what happens. It's, you know, this chicken. And that's what I understood. I said, these animals are so vulnerable and innocent and they trust us. They trust us and we're their guardians and we chuck them in a gas chamber and chop them up into pieces. We betray them on every level. And I just think that is the, oh, that is the worst betrayal to, to lure someone into a false sense of security, feed them, nurture them, look after them and then put them in a slaughterhouse. This is just an injustice on a massive scale. So that's why I... Oh, yeah. That's why I felt obligated to the animals, to speaking the animal message. And I know it's easy to get set off track. There's a lot of things that send you off track. You just gotta remember the animal, the animals need us. The animals need us. So YouTube is a fantastic platform for that. I mean, it's just look at this festival. How many people would never have heard this message if it wasn't for the internet? How many wouldn't have seen James's speech, Ed's interviews, you know, Gary Rosky, if it wasn't on YouTube? This is the platform now. Social media is where to spread this message. I mean, we can talk about types of activism. When I first started doing my activism, I was angry. I was angry. I was just got out of gangs and I didn't know how to like not swear when I talked. I didn't know how to not get aggressive and angry. Like you remember the environment I came from? Like, this is actually the longest I haven't sworn for since I've been <laughs> Give me credit for that, come on. No, like, <laughs> so I have to retrain all this side of me, but, but you find with my older videos, I was angry and I was swearing and I was aggressive because I was like, this is use the bullies, what are you doing? You're eating that burger like that. But now I've, I've realized that the best way to communicate with people is like they're your friend, you know, they're your brother, you were there. You, you know where they're at, you know what I mean? And you can, do, you can be just as powerful as I was when I was swearing and carrying on being aggressive and really emotional by, by logically responding calmly and asking them a question that will lead them to the conclusion. You just have to ask the right questions. I mean, as a human being, they already know that they desire a life of freedom and justice and a life without slavery and suffering. We know that as a human. So you need to speak to that compassion in them. You need to put them in the animal's position, okay? Explain it to them. Do you think, would you, would you accept a bolt gunner in your head for humane slaughter? Would you, do you think that's justified so we can eat a sandwich with some flesh in it? No one does, unless they're being intellectually dishonest. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't. So, so that's how you speak about veganism. You have to ask them a question. Do you think it's justified to push a pig into a gas chamber for some bacon? Now, the gas chambers really spoke to me. I, I, I just can't stress this enough. When I seen that footage that some courageous activists got out of those gas chambers, it just shook me. It shook me. This is the most humane method 
for slaughtering pigs, for stunning pigs, dropping them into, they, they, what they do is they prod them through this cage-like tunnel and they are scared, they are terrified. And they prod them and force them into this gondola, this revolving cage, and they drop them into this gas and they scream, but it's horrible. It is horrible. And I just, I, I can't believe this is the, uh, this is like the pinnacle of humane slaughter in Australia and UK. Like, this is, this is what we consider humane. You know that it's humane dairy standards, highest welfare standards for dairy, that a 24 day, I don't know, a 24 hour old calf can be killed with blunt force trauma to the head, a sledgehammer to kill a one day old calf in the dairy industry. Now, this is humane. This is humane. Well, check it up. Look it up. It's horrible what we're doing to these animals. That's why we need we need to start thinking about how we, we speak to non-vegans as well. We, we need to be, be firm, be truthful, but, but be careful of your approach because I'll learn that lesson. I'll learn that lesson. There's some great activists. James was a major inspiration in that. He told me two years ago, Joey, the truth is powerful enough. You don't need to swear in for two seconds. And I was like, you know what? It's right. What we are saying is so powerful, it's so horrific, it's so meaningful that you don't need to go get all angry, even though I know where you're at. I know how that feels, but we need to respond calmly, logically, and ask legitimate questions. So, how much time we got? Um, eight minutes. Eight minutes? Wow! Okay, 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 okay. Eight minutes, eight minutes. Now, I'll talk to you a little bit about Socratic questioning because there's a bunch of activists that do it really well. Really, really well. And to be honest, when I first started doing interviews, I didn't even know what, who Socrates was. I was like, I think like a pair of Socrates. Like, what? Like, so, but I just, it, I just found it come naturally because it's the least intrusive way to lead someone to the conclusion. You don't even, they don't, you're not forcing anything on them. You're not like, downloading all this information into them, which is still good, but you're just asking a leading question and leading them there. So you just start off with one. So, think slavery's wrong? <laughs> oh yeah, you wouldn't like to be enslaved, right? Totally against it. Okay, okay. So, you know about the dairy industry? <laughs> you know? Cows held against their will, okay? Babies stolen from them, okay? Enslaved for four years while they're serial, forcibly impregnated, serial child kidnapped, okay? And then once their milk production declines, they're killed. Okay, just in case there's any non-vegans in the crowd that weren't sure what I was talking about when it comes to dairy, but that's the closest thing to slavery. It is literally slavery. Have you heard of the dairy industry? So do you realise that by buying dairy, you are directly funding slavery? And do you think that's justified for a glass of milk? Almond milk, soy milk, oat milk, rice milk. See what I'm saying? So they've already told you they're against slavery because they wouldn't want to be enslaved. They've already told you that. You've, you've got them to that point. You've already... Now, if they say that it's justified to, to drink dairy or enslave cow, cows, they created a double standard. They, they, they literally said they're okay with being a hypocrite. And that's fine. Like, I, it took me six months of, being a, of realizing that I'm a hypocrite before I changed. But I think once you get them to that stage and you, real, and you get them to understand that they're living inconsistent with their own beliefs, their own beliefs that they've just, they've just shown you, that, that is the first step. Now they can leave that conversation and, and feel uncomfortable for the rest of their life with the fact that they're, what they're doing is hypocritical. Or maybe one day it might just, they might just take action. But we, all we can do is try and plant that seed and post it all over social media so everyone else sees. <laughs> And hopefully people are watching. So, and that's what we can do. So, planting a seed, plant them wherever you go. And I would say, if I would also say this, there's a lot of activists out there that see what me and James, Ed, other fantastic activists do, and they like, I feel inadequate because I can't do that. I, I can't get up there and just, I can't, you know, hang out the front of a slaughterhouse. I can't stop a truck with my bare hands and save all the pigs. That, or you know, I can't get up there and talk. That's fine. We're not asking you to do that. What we're asking you is to be proactive, proactive spreading the message. It might be at your house, talking to your mum. Just speak up about it. Just, you know, ask your mum some questions. Do you think, you know, 
So not everyone has to do what we do, but everyone can do something and just be specific to your skills. Like, you know, you might be really good at baking vegan cakes. Invite me over, because I'll be there. But, you know, you might be really good at, you know, organising, you know, organising activist events for other activists. You know, that is a very important thing, because like, sometimes it's stressful being an activist. You know, you need people to do other things that we don't, that's why all our skills together um, is, creates a stronger movement. So don't feel inadequate if you can't get out there and do these cool interviews and stuff, but you just, just be proactive, you know what I'm saying? Proactive. So. Um, I will leave you with this quote, and I think it's amazing. It says, so the truth doesn't need to be defended. It's like a lion. You set it free, and it will defend itself. Okay? So you've got the truth on your side. All right? Bam. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.